Hey, folks, welcome back to Life After Addiction Indictment. Today, I've got a phenomenal guest I've been looking forward to for, you know, a couple of months. We uh, had scheduled previously and had something come up, and, and so I'm grateful today to have this gentleman with us. And if, you know, if you're wanting to grow your influence and, and have a better impact, um, I've got the, the guest that's coming up today by the name of Matt McWilliams. He's helped entrepreneurs, just the small types, ones that you probably don't know of, the Tony Robbinses, the Dean Graziosi's. Guys from Shark Tank, uh, Kevin Harrington, um, and the list goes on. I mean, many top marketers, and Matt is a four-time affiliate manager of the year, and he helps online business owners and brands, small and large, leverage the power of partners to grow their businesses, and he teaches people how to do that through affiliate marketing. So thanks for your time, Matt. I know you're busy, guys. So I appreciate you being here today. Hey, thanks for having me, Steve. Hey, man, it's my pleasure. You know, you know your, your background is, is perfect because... Um, you know, your book turned passion into profits. You know, I wanted to talk a little bit about that and maybe have you. Well, first off, let's talk about, you know, what is your backstory a little bit as far as when did you become an entrepreneur? Was that something you kind of had in your blood, you know, as a kid or, you know, where'd you start out? You know, I was always the type of kid who, uh, for whatever reason, like there, there wasn't, it wasn't genetics. It wasn't, um, you know, that I know of, uh, you know, I didn't really have any entrepreneurship in my family. Um, I was not exposed to it directly at a young age, but I was the kid at, you know, seven years old. Uh, I, I, I still do. I had a sweet tooth and uh, my favorite candy was now and laters, you know, oh, I man, star, I starbursts were too, <laughs> starbursts were too soft and too sweet. And now and laters had a little bit of a just a little bit of sour too. And they were little, they took a little bit longer to dissolve. So I wanted the now and laters, but I hated the green and the yellow one, Steve. <laughs> so I had this idea, like if I would go buy, and I was also broke, you know, my mom worked three jobs to keep us on the right side of the tracks, but I could oh, see the wow. tracks from my bedroom window, you know, uh, moved 13 times in my first 14 years, uh, grew up wow. mostly in trailer parks, you know, and, and small apartments. And so you know, and, and I didn't have any problem with that. I didn't know that you, I didn't know that there was another side of the track, yeah. you know, it's just what I yep. was born into. And so, you know, I wanted now and laters though. And there was a problem. <laughs> they cost 50 cents a pack and it came with three sub packs. You got 18 for 50 cents. Now here's the thing. One out of three on average were yellow or green. <laughs> so I figured out that if I could sell that one to somebody who liked yellow and green, for say 20 cents. Now the math wasn't great, but if I could sell them for 20 cents, I could buy 50 cents. So it was only costing me 30 cents to get the ones that I liked anyway. So what That's I would awesome. do is I would go buy like two when I'd saved up a dollar and I'd be able to sell on average two and I'd make 40 cents back. Sometimes I might even sell them for 25 cents for the little packs because that's what they cost at the convenience store. And I'd make half my money back. I'd get two thirds of the candy but for half the cost. Well, then yeah. once I'd done that enough and I wasn't spending quite as much money to fuel my habit, you know, again, I'm seven, sugar's a habit at that age. You know, I actually say it's like something like a hundred times more addictive than cocaine. And so here I am, I'm funding my habit. And then I was, my mom had, uh, there was a, a where, a, a, like a precursor to Costco in our town. I forget what it was. It wasn't any Sam's club. It was another one, but it was like one of those bulk places. Now I could go buy 18 packages of these for about $13. Then I would sell the green and the yellow ones for 25 cents. And so this started going on and on. It got to the point where I could actually start breaking just about even and still get four of the little things a day of candy wow. that I wanted. And so that was all I cared about. But I learned at a young age kind of how to sell and how to, to I learned about inventory and I learned how to take the money and, okay, I'm going to sit what I did. And, and again, I was like, wow, this sounds genius when you say it at the age of 43. At the time, I didn't know, <laughs> but I would spend the dollar. I'd buy the two things. I'd eat my four, but I take that 40 or 50 cents and I always saved it up. So oh. then I had enough money to go spend $13 in 26 That's days awesome. or so I had $13. And then from there I'd save up even more. And so it actually got into a pretty big venture to where I was even selling the cherry and the strawberry and the grape. <laughs> and I was selling them at a markup. I was selling just the little packs for 25 cents. 
they were 25 cents at the convenience store, but I was buying them now for the same price as the convenience store. Then I figured, okay, this is when it really got, what if I undercut the convenience store a little bit, sell them for just a little bit less. Now I was like taking all their business and and this sounds like crazy, but there were days where I made $5, (laughs) $5. It's a bunch of money at that that age though. I mean, that's That is 20 ice cream sandwiches. That is the currency. (laughs) It's like cigarettes in prison. It is the currency of seventh, uh, second grade is ice cream sandwiches, you know? That is great. So that was the starting point. And then, you know, we can fast forward to um, many, many years later, you know, uh, it was in my early twenties and I, I had some good opportunities there, but then, uh, you know, there was a point in my life where, uh, I stood in front of a judge and if he'd wanted to, he could have put me in prison for 42 years and, um, 42, huh? Wow. Yeah. If he'd wanted to, we, you know, everybody knows he wasn't going to, you know, they, they give right. me a bargain and stuff, but yeah, I mean, I, I had, uh, so, uh, was it six counts of seven years or seven counts of six years? I never can remember. And I don't really care. Um, <laughs> You know, it was a very long story that we don't need to get into about what led to that. But, you know, I'm standing in front of the judge and uh, here he is sentencing me. I'm sitting there with my court court appointed attorney next to me. What was your age uh, at this time? What was that? Well, how old were you at this point? So the, it was 22, it was 23, it was just about to turn 24. Okay. And um, I'm sitting there and the judge decides, you know, well, along with the district attorney that I'm, you know, rather than go to prison for 42 years, which would have sucked a lot, um, you know, and of course, rather than go through a whole trial and there's a chance I might win. And, you know, quite frankly, I still think I might have, but that was a whole different story. You know, we, we plea bargain and it was two years of probation with 90 days house arrest, you know, and the judge, I'm 24, I was, I was 20, 23, actually, just about to turn 24. It was like a week or two before my 24th birthday. And the judge goes, what do you do for a living? This is as he's giving me my 90 days house arrest. I didn't know that when you have house arrest, <laughs> yeah. you get the good kind, you actually get to leave quite a bit. You just have to yeah. be home so during certain hours. Screwed yourself. And well, he goes, what Let's do you do? And I go, coming. I looked at him and go, I work from home and my attorney yeah. kicks me under the table and I'm like, I'm a young punk. And I'm just being like, Pfft. I'm like, what is it to you, dude? I work from home. You, you, yeah. know, you idiot. You're it's not honest. the smartest thing. Well, the funny part was I left home more. I was starting a business. I was trying to do this online thing, but I got, you know, I got in trouble, did some stuff I shouldn't. And I was, you know, again, I had seven counts or six, I think it was six counts, seven years of, you know, perjury and all whatever, some other stuff. I don't even remember what they call it. And uh, long story short is I, I actually left the house more under house arrest because when you can only leave from nine to 11 at nine Oh one, you're in the car right. and you don't get back till 10 58. You know? right. And then I learned after this was a funny thing. Cause they let me off after a year. I learned the day after they let me off the, my parole officer, who's like, he comes up and he's like, Hey, just so you know, we give you a 15 minute buffer because he was like, I noticed that you always got back <laughs> Perfectly. Right? like, you know, two minutes early. He's like, yeah, I probably should have told you that, but you know, it, it worked yeah. out good. Cause never, had, never had to worry about it. He's like, I gotta be honest after about the first two weeks, I stopped even checking your stuff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I was like, dang it. I didn't know that I could have had 30 more minutes. I could have yeah. left early and got back later. Um, but yeah, it is kind of funny when you work from home and you know, you're young when you, when you only have, 32 hours a week to actually leave. I was gone 31 and a half hours. You know, I would just sometimes <laughs> so, I would just leave and go for drives, which I never used to do. Just because exactly. I, yeah. You, you start, you uh, realize how much you take for granted, you know, the ability to move around and go, yeah. go out places. And then all of a sudden it, but, it does matter. But that was the thing. I write about it in the book, actually, you know, uh, and step three of my book, Turn Your Passions into Profits, I talk about capturing attention. And one of the things is you have to be willing to get personal. Like if you're going to capture yes. attention in today's marketplace, you've got to be willing to get personal. And so I share the I mean, story of a guy named- which, which is also, I'm assuming- Personal meaning, vulnerable, authentic, right? Well, yeah, and and you know, I'll 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 flip to it in the book actually, but I I share the story about Tom Whitesell. Tom Whitesell, he's like, do you know why I wanted to buy from you? He he bought our course, and I said, well, yeah, that's market research. And he's like, because you wrote a book a, a blog post about the time you almost went to prison, and I shared that story, you know, and in the book I actually share the thing, you know, and talk about when I was twenty, I say twenty five. That's right, it was right before I turned. It was right before I turned 25, not 24. Uh, a grand jury indicted me on seven counts. There we go. Seven counts of perjury. So six years, as I thought. 
you know, Jeez. I'd run for the school board, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I, I go on to write about that. And as I say, you know, I'm, I'm reading it in the book. Like th- I say this, Tom told me that when he read that post, he knew he could trust me a hundred percent. If I was willing to share that dark part of my life and admit to screwing up, I'd be open and transparent in my dealings with him going forward. That is the power of being open, honest, and uncomfortably personal. Do you think I like sharing that story? Of course not. I'm not sitting by my fire, my ugly Christmas sweater on Christmas Eve saying, gather around, Jordan, let's talk about the time daddy had to wear an ankle bracelet. And even just copying and pasting that post now into this book made me squirm. But the point there is like, that is one of the ways that you stand out. Like we all have a story, whether it is addiction, whether it is indictment, whether it's, you know, that you actually went to prison, whether you did this, whether you did that, we all have a story. And I think too much of our society we actually think that we have to hide that fact. Yeah. I don't shy away from the fact. Like, I don't Me go neither. out. It's not my lead thing. Like, you didn't read in your, you know, in your introduction. Matt's worked with Kevin Harrington and Michael Hyatt and Tony right. Robbins. And he almost went to prison. Like, that's not my lead. Right. But if you ask me about it, I'm going to talk to you about it. And it actually does give a unique side to like, hey, uh, granted, I know I did not go to prison. No, I've never, you know, I didn't go to that depth. But like, I know what it's like to be terrified. I sat on the couch when they handed down the indictments and I literally remember just sitting on the couch. It was the first time in my life I'd ever prayed. You know, I mean, I was, I, I sobbed. I, I'm not a crier. That's just not how God made me. Right. Yeah. It's not that I don't have emotions. I just don't generally cry. I cry at the end of Rudy. I do cry at the end of Rudy. (laughs) Also gladiator and Braveheart. Those are movies I cry at. And I remember just like, I finally broke down and I cried my mom. I was living with my mom and she just went over and gave me the biggest hug and prayed with me. And I'm like, you know, that's part of my story. Like I've been there, I've done that. And if you can come from that uh, to where I am today, like my clients don't care about the fact that I almost went to prison 20 years ago. Yeah. That doesn't, that's not a thing that matters to them. I, I've talked about it. I've, I've shared the story. It's on my blog to this day. It's not like I'm hiding it. If you Google right. Matt McWilliams, eventually you will find the story about me almost going to prison. I don't, I don't try to hide that. Yeah, that's the most important thing, I think, because yeah. I've seen it just in, you know, when I've shared my story, if 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 somebody's listening doesn't believe that, just go and and post something truly real like that, honest. And if you're not used to seeing much engagement, you'll see a whole different response. It's just it's yeah. crazy. But I think in in today's world, you know, I do think people really are just looking for that authenticity. You know, real people. So true. Instead of that fake, everyone's showing just the positive stuff because then, then you don't know who, you know, what is that person really about? You know, you can't, yeah. you don't know if you really can trust them. So, I mean, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. That is so well, that, important. One of my favorite quotes in the book is from a guy named Stephen Furtick. And, and I'm writing it in a context of like, you know, we're, we're trying to build an online platform. Okay. And to build an online platform, you've got to be a leader. You've got to stand out. You've got to have their credentials and all those things. You know, you've got to be, you got to be a leader in the marketplace. Yeah. And I say, stop comparing yourself to others because we think to be a leader <laughs> means we have to be two miles ahead of everybody else. Trap. Yep. Yeah. That, you know, the example I share in the book is like, you know, imagine you're on a hike and there's always this particular hike I'm thinking of. It's in the mountains of Tennessee. It's about six miles long, you go up about two miles. Uh, not, don't literally go up two miles. I think it's only up like five, 4,000 feet or something, but, or whatever. It feels right, like it's an incline the whole time. Yeah. But you go up, you climb for about two miles. Then you go along this ridge and up a little bit more for another two miles. And the, there's this middle stretch on this ridge where, I mean, it's, it's single file and one wrong step and you will die. I mean, it's like, this is not a joke. You will fall to your death. There's no way you're surviving this fall. And I picture this and like, the example I give is we think we have to be two miles ahead, but if you think about like, we've all got that like super fit friend, right? He's the guy who's been in shape since the day you met him. You don't have to ask him if he does CrossFit because he's already told you he does six <laughs> times this week, wears bike shorts everywhere, even to cookouts, you know, jogs in place at stoplights. We've all got that friend, right? Smells like soup mix all the time. Like that's <laughs> the friend, right? And he's up two miles ahead on this hike, this dangerous hike. And he's yelling at you going, hurry up and watch yeah. out for the, Watch out for the what, dude, I can't hear you. You're two miles ahead of me. The better place to lead from is one step ahead where we can reach back, grab their hand and say, Hey, watch out for this. It's dangerous right here. And so we think we have to be some sort of like massive expert and we have to have life perfect. And so there's a quote in the book from Stephen Furtick. He says, the reason we struggle with insecurity is because we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reels. 
So Jeez. we compare so our deep. sometimes dark reality. We compare, oh, you know what? Guess what? You're not the only kid whose toilet, who's, you're not the only parent whose kids ever overflowed the toilet. Yeah. You're not the only parent who's ever had a kid who's failed a class. You're not the only parent whose kids lies to them sometimes. You're not the only person who struggled with pornography or drugs or alcohol or whatever it is. You're yeah. not the only person who's ever been to jail. You're not the only person who's ever been fingerprinted. Like, again, do you think I like talking about that? Like, I, I mean, right. like I didn't just walk around the store going, hey, everybody, look at this. Look at my ankle bracelet. Isn't it awesome? It's huge. It's really uncomfortable. It digs into the skin, causes it to bleed sometimes. Isn't that great? I didn't go around. Like I tried to hide it at that time, yeah. but it's been, it's been a while. It's been 20 years. And even 10 years later, I stopped comparing the fact that I went through that. I stopped thinking about the fact that yes, there was a time where I sat on my mom's sofa sobbing uncontrollably because I could completely law. Like I didn't know what was going to happen in my life. I moved. Past. That's my behind the scenes. I'm, yeah. if, if I compare that to everyone else's highlight reel and think that their life is freaking perfect when it's yeah. not that that's insecurity, that's going to be insecurity. So then we think, Oh, I can't lead a life of, I can't be a leader. I can't build a platform. Nobody will listen to me about this other thing, whatever this other thing is. It doesn't, you don't have to be a leader in like, like you, Steve, you don't have to be leading in the, the space of, in, uh, of addiction or right. overcoming those, those struggles in life. You, your passion might be something completely unrelated to your backstory. Your passion might be helping people to be better accountants or helping people to grow organic tomatoes in a cold climate. I don't know. Like that's, that's what the whole first part of the book is about is like getting clear on that passion. And we yeah. can walk you through those steps if you want, Steve. But like, once we discover that passion, we're clear on the passion. It opens up the doors to everything else. And I truly believe like what, what Stephen Pressfield writes about at the beginning of the, the war of art. Oh, yeah you know, about, about Hitler, you know, um, Hitler wanted to be an artist. Yeah. That's that right. was his passion. Hitler wanted to be an artist. He denied that he got rejected by one school. It was like, it was basically like getting rejected from Harvard and going, gosh, I got rejected from Harvard. I got to go to Ohio state now, you know, right. like that's like a crappy school or something, you know, gosh, he got rejected from basically the Harvard of European art and gave up on art. Just yeah, throw it out. And, and and what Pressfield basically I writes, mean, and I'm not quoting verbatim, he's like, if he had just gone to his second choice and gotten accepted, there would have not been a World War II. Isn't that crazy? And it's if you think about crazy. that, like that's but we think we have to be able to do this thing when and, and be at this level when when we don't. Yeah, no doubt. What do, what do you advise that person maybe that isn't sure what their passion is? I mean. How do you help yes, them? There's, yeah, there's three questions that I go through. Uh, so these are all in the book, but I'll, I'll walk you through them here you okay. know, step by step. Number one question is, what is it that people are always asking you for help with? So people are always coming to you and saying, yep. like, dude, you're the guy. You're the guy. You're I me. Mean, you're the affiliate guy. You know, there's a whole story I can share later about why my podcast and my brand is the affiliate guy. And it's actually because I didn't want to be the affiliate guy. But what did people come to me with? Matt, I need help growing my email list. I need help starting an affiliate program. I need help doing affiliate marketing, making money online, right? That, that's what yep. people came to me and asked me for help with. Uh, Jonathan Milligan, my friend, Jonathan Milligan, he was a career blogger. So he basically did a lot of stuff about uh, resumes and interviews and stuff like that. And then one day people started coming to him and saying, well, how'd you start this blog? How'd you start a blog? So now he's a, he's a blog coach. Wow. Uh, the second question is, what is it that people tell you is, is really interesting about you? So what is that skill that, that you have? You may have been born with it, or it was, you know, we think back to, like, I was never, uh, I was never like, you know, you know, when I was five, I wanted to be in marketing or online marketing. We didn't even have the internet back then. Right. You know I was doing it five though. This is, my, this is what my mom said, five, four and five years old, I would hand copy entire encyclopedia books. Really? There's a reason why I'm fascinated by the world. Like I love history and I love things. I just love learning uh -huh. because that was, that was, that was in my DNA. I was born that way. It is a genetic, you know, call it God, call it whatever, you know, that was a genetic thing that I was just born. There's no, nobody put that in me. That just happened. Right, right. But I had the environment to foster that, thankfully, because my mom bought it. And it's like, actually, I learned later. I thought I said my mom bought it, but I learned 
more recently within the past year, my grandmother bought it for us actually. Um, as I told that story so many times and my mom was like, Oh yeah, correction. I didn't buy it. <laughs> you know, that was, that was girl me KT. She bought that. And so anyway, somebody bought me an encyclopedia set and I was able to copy it, you know? So what is it that people say is really interesting about you? Uh, Dan Carlin, who has one of the most popular podcasts on the entire internet has a podcast called hardcore history. Uh, it's personally my favorite podcast. Uh, I, I love history. So I love listening to it. He's not a historian though. Really? How did he start yeah. the world's most popular history podcast that literally has tens of millions of downloads per episode? Okay. Wow. Some perspective because he would sit there at the Thanksgiving table, you know, at the dinner table at Thanksgiving, and they'd be talking about something. And next thing you know, he's telling a story about some obscure thick guy that fought at the Battle of Bulge. And then he's talking about the, the this and the that and how World War I actually started and all the geopolitical stuff. And people are going, wow, Dan, that's really interesting. And he's like, maybe I could turn this into a career. So that's question number two. So first one, what is it the people are always asking you for help with? Secondly, what is it the people tell you is really interesting about you? Third thing, what did you struggle with, but now you enjoy success at? So the example in the book, and I, you know, this is a, a show about addiction and, and indictment, right? Okay, we all can think of something we used to struggle with, but maybe we, you know what, gosh, I've been clean for 10 years, or I, I've I've done this for 15 years, you know, whatever. I found the way that worked for me. Could you possibly, could that be? I'm not yeah. saying it is, but could that be your thing? So in the book, I write about Alan Thomas. It's the longest uh, story in the book. It's almost three and a half pages long. Uh, Alan woke up one day at the age of 50, he was 56 when he woke up. I, I, I got it right in the book because I asked him to review it. But in his late 50s, and he weighed 304 pounds. And he said, Matt, I was, I was, I've always been obese. I was the husky teenager. I was the fat 20 year old, the fat 30 year old. These are his words, not mine. The fat 40 year old, the fat 50 year old. He sold life insurance, ironically. And he said, I realized wow. as I looked at that scale and wow. it said 304 pounds, I realized three things. Number one, I have never met a man at the age of 70 who was 300 pounds, you know, in my height. He's like 5'10. All right. I've never met a guy who's more than 50, 60 pounds overweight that lived to the age of 70. He said, number two, I realized wow. in that moment that and I would always be fr from some point in the future on, I would be known as Angie's first husband. And number three, I knew right then and there that someone else was going to wow. walk my daughter down the aisle. Nine months later, he weighed 175 pounds. Dang. This is a guy who for 45 years had been overweight, wow. maybe 50 years. It was in his DNA, you could say. It that's just, it had become crazy. comfortable. It's what he was known as. That's who yeah. he was. It was his identity and he changed everything in the course of nine months. So what does he do now? He helps other people do the same thing. So think about that. What did you struggle with, but now you enjoy success at, at the end of those three questions? Very cool. You know, that you know what you're passionate about. You know, like the key here is to be to who you help. Your audience is intentional. You get to choose who you help. This is the thing. You get to choose who your audience is. Yeah. And if you try to serve everyone, unless you're doing toilet paper, <laughs> you know, if you try, and even toilet paper, there are different audiences for different toilet paper, you know, because you got the hotel manager toilet paper. Yeah. It's like, how, how cheap can I buy this? And is, can I get it delivered in, in packages of a million? Yeah. And then you got like the, uh, we don't use anything but Charmin crowd, right? Yeah, that's right. Even the toilet paper Charmin. has audiences. <laughs> but if you try to serve everyone, you end up serving no one. So you have to get very granular and think like that's important. Hardcore history is for history buffs. If you're like, a, eh, I kind of like history a little bit, you're not going to like this podcast. It's terrible. If, if yeah. you, if you have no, does, if, if you, if you're one of those people who's been like, ah, when you were 45, you were really in shape, but at 50, you put on 10 pounds. Alan's not your guy. The guys that come to Alan are the guys who's Alan, I'm 52 years old. I weigh 400 pounds. I'm 38 years old. I've been overweight since I was six and nobody else has been able to help me. And they say to him all the time, all these other people out there teaching weight loss, they've been fit since they were 15 years old, Alan. You know what it's like to be me. And I think that's what yep. we're looking for. You know what it's like to be me. This book is for people who are struggling to start an online platform and build a business, a successful business from scratch. You know why I can write that? Because I know what it's like to have been in that position. I know what it's like yeah. to have woke up every morning going, I got this. I'm going to, I'm going to blog today. Whoo, write a blog post. Whoo, lots of blog posts. I'm, I'm this, I'm having, I'm passionate about what I'm doing, but I haven't made any money in two years. 
Yeah. I'm ready to give like all the coaches that I've hired, you know, regardless of what it's for in my life, it's always, I'm looking for the person that is where I want to be. That's been where I'm at, you know, exactly. not that person that's always had, you know, the great genes or whatever you want to call this, that's fit all, you know, their whole life. Cause they don't know what it's like to struggle with the weight, you know, or the, the poor diet habits, whatever. So that's to me, that's really important. That's great. Yeah. So well, let's, let's, where, where have you been and where, where are you now? That's yes. Like, yeah. A lot of times is where your passion is. Perfect. That's a great point. Well, so let's hit a little bit on the affiliate marketing. Um, sure. Say that, you know, somebody, you know, still maybe struggles and maybe they don't have the confidence, whatever, to really go after that passion. Maybe they just don't have the clarity yet. Um, you know, but they they want to do something. They want to, you know, make money online, um, you know, or th- sell a product, whatever it is, but they just really don't have it yet. Let's talk a little bit about affiliate marketing and how people can start by using other people's products or services. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, I'm going to back up a little bit on this one, Steve, because there's, there's, a, there's a mindset thing here with monetization, monetizing your platform. We go into this, right? I want to help people who've been where I was. I want to, I want to impact all these people. I want to change the world. Well, I don't know about making money. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lie that is so pervasive in the online platform world. It absolutely makes me 60 because it says that monetizing a platform is a form of selling out. All right. Oh, yeah. it, the, the lie that says as soon as you start thinking like a business owner and not some benevolent content creator, that it changes you from someone who's seeking to serve into some, you know, mogul, right? Like yeah. you're greedy, right? It's simply not true. Here's the key point. It does not serve your audience not to monetize. You have to make money to sustain it. I just mentioned that. Yes. Yeah. I was at that point. I was changing the world. I was getting the emails. I was getting the blog comments that were saying, Matt, you've changed my life. You saved my marriage. You made me a better leader. You did this. You did this. Here's the deal. My kid's soccer. It's about $2,000 a year, a kid. Yeah. I can't forward them a blog comment and say, do I get a hundred dollars off? That's right. The mortgage company that we used to have, thankfully we paid off the house, but we used to have a mortgage. I tried. I'm kidding. I didn't really, but I can't send them like an email and say, oh, we're only going to pay you a thousand dollars this month. Cause this email that says Matt yeah. impacted my life, saved my marriage, gets us $300 off. Right. That doesn't work. You need money, not just to do those things, but even to fund your website. Like we pay yeah. 140 bucks a month for website hosting. So if I don't make at least $140 just from that, I'm not even talking about all the other expenses, just yeah. to host the website, I lose money. Yep. So that's not a sustainable business model. So option one, create a product. That's option one. Option two, give away content indefinitely. Option one, well, that sucks because when I'm starting out, I don't know what my audience wants. Yeah. I don't know what price points they'll buy at. I don't know how to sell. I'm not, you know, I'm not comfortable with that yet. I'm not a salesman. What product do they want? How do I market it? I don't know any of that stuff. Yeah. So I go, well, I guess I'll just give away content indefinitely. So that sets them up to just expect that and never have me sell anything to them. And, and so the idea that, that those are the only two options is not true. Yeah. All right. Because when you're starting out, you got a tiny audience, you got a hundred people, 50 people, 200 people, whatever the number is, no one's paying attention to you. It's the perfect time to start monetizing because so many people out there, they teach you, you got to have, you know, X followers, you got to have blogged or (laughs) podcasted for Y number of years. You need to have Z, whatever, like, what are we doing? Algebra? We're not doing algebra, right? Ultimately, it's all about mindset said Steve, because how you view making money from your passion is what determines how much you can make and how much of an impact you can make. So many people preach when you start a platform, you just need to give, 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 just create content, content, content. Like I mentioned earlier, that's what sets you up for burnout. That is what sets you up for burnout. And so one of the things, the reasons I love affiliate marketing so much is that affiliate marketing bridges the gap between having nothing to sell and selling nothing at all. Oh, that's great. Bridges that gap. So instead of, oh, I've got to create a product. Instead of, I've got to create a product and I'm not really sure how to, to market it. Or I'll just give away content indefinitely. Those are the two extremes. Instead, you get to monetize immediately. You don't have to do any customer service, no fulfillment. You don't need a warehouse. Yeah. You can sell physical products and you don't have to put them anywhere. 
Yeah. There's nice. no hidden cost because here's the thing. When I sell a product for a hundred dollars, right? Well, first of all, I have my support person who has to answer the emails when something doesn't work. And that costs me $4, let's just say $4 an email. I have to pay the credit card processing, which costs me another three. And I have to host the thing and then they have to log in. And, and you know, that 90, that hundred dollar pr purchase might only cost me 20 bucks, but it's still $20. Yeah. You know, it's not a ton, but it's still something that's a, those are hidden costs. We don't even think about those. Like I forget that we'll pay, we'll pay almost $50,000 this year in credit card fees. That's yeah. literally almost an entire team member that we could hire for what we will pay in credit card fees. And we forget about that sometimes as business owners. It's not even a line item on our sheet, on our spreadsheet. Yeah, that's right. It should be. So no hidden costs, no risk. If I don't sell something, oh, well. But even more importantly, it teaches me how to sell. I get to do what I call PTP. I get paid to practice. I'm paying, Great, yeah. I'm getting paid to practice. I learn what works for my audience. So what price points are they going to buy it? What sales strategies work? What topics are they going to, are they going to be more interested in? What promotional methods? Maybe I sell, maybe I send an email and I only sell two, but then I go live on Facebook and I sell seven. What did I, I learned yeah. something there, right? Uh, yeah. It trains your audience to buy. This is an important thing when you're first starting out, you have nothing of your own. So you just give away content for a year. And then you go, wow, I have enough people. I can create my own product. Well, not only do you not know what they want and all that stuff, but your audience that signed up on day one, They've gone a year and you've never asked them to buy anything. Yep. You've conditioned them to not buy. And there's so many other benefits I talk about in the book, but those are the big, the like the big seven there is, is just, again, it's positioning you that when you do launch your own product, you can do so successfully without all the risk and fulfillment and all that stuff involved. Yeah. I mean, that's, man, I wish I had, you know, had that option when I was young, you know, because that mm -hmm. does, it, it makes things so much easier I mean, it's, don't get me wrong, you know, all this stuff is not easy, but no. it's much easier. If, if you have the work ethic to put in the time, you definitely can have success. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, what if, what do you recommend to the person maybe that you know, is a lot of people that have had struggles, including myself, hmm. which is why I started this, even though I've been very successful for, you know, I went through what I went through. I allowed myself to be stuck from a mindset standpoint, which obviously affected my confidence, which was really the biggest thing that held me back. Do you have any uh, insights or suggestions on, you know, what people could do to help, you know, rebuild their confidence if they've lost it? Hmm. It's not easy. No, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not. not easy. Um, you know, I am definitely not a trained psychologist. I mean, I, I, I don't have any problem admitting, you know, I work with a, a counselor. Uh, I work with them for ADHD, you know, and, and some other stuff, ADHD and leadership, but, and he's, he's opened my eyes, you know, just to the way that the brain works. Uh, I also did study psychology for an entire year at the university of Tennessee. So oh, wow. uh, I'm basically an expert on this stuff. <laughs> I, I'm not, I know for me, um, you know, with confidence, again, it does go back a little bit to, you know, not comparing your beginning to someone else's middle or end. Yes. That's, uh, that's one, not comparing your behind the scenes with other people's highlights. Um, I know for me, this is, you know, for me personally, it, it is reminding myself of the truth. And, you know, that might be from, you know, from sacred texts, if, you know, in, in different religions, it might mm -hmm. be just in affirmations. There's a lot of declarations in the book, for example, uh, you know, and I, and I write about in the very beginning of the book, I, I say, like, you may think that these declarations are corny. Uh, I'm just going to find one of them here. I will not be afraid to get personal with my followers. We just talked about that one. Um, you know, that that's one that we talked about with that story from, you know, from Tom yeah. White. So, uh, here's another declaration. I will reframe my disadvantages and focus on what they make possible for me. I will turn my negatives into positives. Um, those are just some declarations. We say those things, you go, oh, it's so corny, right? You know, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone it, people like me, you know. Uh, you can either say those things and think that they're, you're being corny. And, um, you know, and, and if you if you don't believe that saying those things out loud is going to make a difference, they're not going to. Right. Uh, Zig Ziglar said, you know, you can do anything in life better with positive thinking than negative thinking. That does not mean that if I go, okay, I think I can, I think I can, <laughs> I'm going to be able to dunk. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm on a mission. I'm 43 year old, 43 years old. And by my 44th birthday, I want to be able to dunk again. 
I haven't yeah. dunked a basketball since I was 23, maybe 24. <laughs> uh, I was right around that same time, you know, it was about a year before I, you know, sat in front of that judge that I yeah. last dunked a basketball. Uh, I want to be able to dunk a basketball. Again. I'm about five inches away. Positive thinking is not going to get me five inches. What is going to get me the five inches is busting my butt in the gym. All right. That's what's going to get me to dunk a basketball again. But I can promise you, if I think negatively, I will fail. Negative thinking Absolutely. is a guaranteed recipe for failure. Positive thinking is not a guaranteed recipe for success. So yep. I'll just think positive. So for me, it's just reframing everything as a truth. Like there are times, you know what? I yell at my kids. And I hate that I do when I do it. Yeah. There is the voice for a moment that tells me, you, you know, you did it again. You're, you're just a terrible dad. Sometimes my son, when he doesn't get his way, will tell me or my wife, you know, just like pretty much every kid ever has, I hate you. You're the yeah. worst dad ever. <laughs> All right. And he'll say that now I can choose to believe that, you know what? I, I really am because I yelled at you the other day. And I am, I'm just, I am a terrible dad and this isn't about comparisons, but then I have to remind myself, wait a minute, I have gotten you to soccer practice on time, 99 of the last hundred times you've had soccer practice. Yeah. I have, this isn't about buying things, but I have made sure that you've had all the things that you need. Yeah. You have never missed a meal. You have never been, you know, been cold because we didn't provide, you know, the right stuff. The heat went out one time and we were all a little cold, <laughs> <You know? laughs> but like outside of that, you know, um, you've never gone hungry and I've always made time for you within reason. I've played, I've spent a lot of time playing games with you and, and loving you. And I give you a hug every day and I tell you, I love you every day. And all this, you know what? I'm not a terrible dad. Do I make yeah. mistakes? Absolutely. Did I mess up? Yeah. Does he deserve an apology for me raising my voice today? Yes, he does. And I do. But you just, I, for me, I reframe that. So if it's in business, you know, for instance, we went through a big struggle a few years ago, uh, like when a lot of people did, you know, we went through a really difficult time. Uh -huh. uh, we went from riding pretty high to basically getting down to the point where uh, we, so we were from, yeah, riding pretty high. I'll just say that doing really well. Yeah. To, we were, uh, probably about $80,000 in debt. And this is from a, a couple, my wife and I are business partners who said, swore we'd never go into debt again. Like we hadn't been in debt in over 10 years and we were never going to have debt. And all of a sudden we had debt. Yeah. And again, the voices say, see all those people that you told, that, you know, you, yeah, you paid off your mortgage and you were debt free and, and you got all excited and you were trying to tell them that we were the example and you can do it too. And all those people you told to cut up their credit cards and all those people you told to, you know, gosh, like don't get a car payment and don't do like all these people that you told don't go into debt and here you are living a lie. That was what the voices said. Yep. And I was, I, 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 I mean, I was at that point where I was just like, okay, what is the best way out of this? You know, what do we, do we give up the business? Like, I mean, I, and I'll, I'll admit, I've, I've never shared this publicly, but there were times where I thought, you know, I got $2 million in life insurance on yeah. me. Dude, I hear you. It's crazy where the you mind know, will go. I, I, I mean, yeah. I, I joke, I'm still technically worth more dead than alive right now, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's but crazy. there were times I was like, okay, <laughs> is, that the, is that the best thing for my family? Cause I don't know the way out of this. And then I went, wait a minute. Okay. Yep. We, we had a struggle. We made a couple of mistakes, but we know the way out because it's the same path out. It's the same path they outline in the book. Yeah. It's like, get back to the basics. So we went back to the basics and we started, I mean, I kid you not, we started at step one. Okay. Who do we really help? We're trying to help three different audiences here. We can't help three different audiences. At the very least, we need to narrow this down to two. We had two pretty distinct audiences. Okay. Let's focus on them. So we help them. All right, come on. Now we need to commit to the leading side. And I got back into that and saying, okay, here's how we're going to do this. And then, okay, we went back to like step four. It's all about basically, you know, how to, how to convert visitors into subscribers. And we went back to the basics and said, okay, our lead magnets, right? These things that we're going to get people to subscribe to, they're way too complicated. How do we simplify these? 
like I, these are the things like we're teaching people to do X, Y, and Z, but I'm doing R, S, yeah. W, B, Q, some letters that don't exist. I've got like some hieroglyphics in there, a couple of Roman letters, like, come on, <laughs> let's, let's simplify this. Let's get back to what we teach on this stuff. And we did that. And we actually came out on the other side, not even a year and two months later. That's phenomenal. better than we have ever been. It was like, we went from $80,000 in debt. And I mean, I remember we went, boom, we paid, we paid like the, like a couple months later, we 20,000 towards that another month, 15, another month, 10, another month, 10, another month. But awesome. we, we had that sucker paid off in like seven months. And then boom, six months later, we're back to where we have, you know, we got a big team and we got six months expenses in the bank. Like, and it happened. It felt like in a flash. And then wow. I discovered something about myself. This was really kind of fascinating. I discovered I had, I had two issues. Uh, there's two books that see, seem so indirectly unrelated. It's not even funny. Uh, the one is called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. And he talks about upper limiting. Um, never really, I read it and kind of just put it in the back of my mind. Like, whatever, I got that, read that book. Cool, doesn't apply to me. The second book is actually a book called Extraordinary Golf. <laughs> really? And I haven't played golf in 17 years or seven years was the last time I played. I haven't played competitively since 2002. Um, and, uh, but I read this book about four years ago. Just, I don't even know why I read it. And one of the things that he talks about is the culture of golfers. Now, th this is the, the point about golf is not the point here. He talks about this culture of we have to be looking for something to fix. You can almost say it's like the culture of men. Interesting. We have yeah. to, we have to find something that's broken so we can fix it. Cause we have to be working on something. And I realized that number yeah, one, I had upper so. limited. I had upper limited myself that when I got to a certain level where things got really comfortable, I started to sabotage things. Oh yeah. Not yeah. in like, okay, hey, you know what? Let's go, uh, uh, let's go, you know, take $20,000 and go put it on black. That That's not what I mean. Right. Right. No. Um, let, let's go hire a bunch of people really, really fast so that, yeah, it will come out better on the flip side. We need to hire these people, but we need to hire them slowly, but no, let's hire them really fast. And here's the hidden reason so that we can put ourselves back in a position where it gets nervous again, because that's where I thrive because I'm a guy and I have to be fixing things and I need a mission to be able to fix because I operate best in chaos because I'm the guy that when things are, when the stuff's hitting the fan around me, I'm the guy going, dude, I got this. I'm, 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 I'm at peace. I'm, I'm, I'm like the most chill person on earth. When the stuff hits the fan, when it's close to hitting the fan, I'm a nervous freaking wreck. But once it hits it and, and my wife's panicking, cause the bank account's going down every month. I'm like, cool. I yeah. got this. And so I realized I connected those two things. Number one, I was upper limiting. And so I would sabotage. Sometimes we sabotage when life's going really well, we have to create chaos. That's what we think. Sometimes when life's going really well, we'll get sick. You know, yeah. things are going great. I need to be sick for 10 days. So it's, it's a weird thing, but it is so um, true. And I I'm laughing because I've, I've lived, I've lived exactly what you were saying yeah. there. It's, it is fascinating. You're right. It's crazy. And so when we do that, you know, many ways, that's actually what sets us up. You know, we, we, I, I part of that is like, I, I remember about eight years ago. So we lived, uh, we moved to this house in 2011, 2011. Yeah. 2011, about 2015. So about seven years ago from now, uh, I started getting really antsy. Uh -huh. I lived in this house for four years. I'd never lived in a single place for four years in my life. Wow. I moved 13 times in my first four years. Yeah, that makes sense. I moved, uh, about 18 or 19 times in my first 25 years of life. Wow. And then even like when I got married, we got married, we lived in the same house for one year. Then we moved to another house and then we moved, uh, we had to move because we moved up to Fort Wayne and we lived in a furnished apartment. So I was like, even in the first uh, four years of marriage, we moved four times. Wow. I, I never lived in a place for more than three and a half years in my entire life. So at four years, I started getting antsy. We started driving Great. around town and looking at other homes. I started hating my house. This house that for three years had been, I mean, 
it's the it's the dream like i, I mean my yeah. daughter wakes up every morning looks out <laughs> of, over our pond into a backyard where there's deer we live in a freaking zoo we've found like 88 different types of animals. We have a creek that runs through. Our kids get to go play out there anytime they want. When it snows, we have the best sledding hill, probably we have the best residential sledding hill in the city of Fort Wayne. All right, got, if I drop you in our backyard in the middle of summer, you'd think you're out in the country. There's, we don't have neighbors, but yet we're five minutes from everything. You know, and outside cool. of the fact that you can distantly hear when a when a semi truck hits the little side strips on the interstate, which is about a mile away, yeah. there's no noise. I live in freaking paradise. The house is twice the size of anything I've ever been in in my life. I live in paradise, Steve. And, and you I feel started, like it's time to move. <laughs> and I started hating. I found everything that was wrong with why Isn't they put this light. Why they put that light switch there? Why do I have to reach three inches to the right to hit the garbage disposal? Like it sounds like wow, first world problems, right? Like yeah. why, 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 why does this happen? Why this house is stupid? Why is that thing designed like that? What, what kind of idiot designed the closet like this? You know? Yeah. And I'm like, those are the types of things. That, and I went through that for two years. I was miserable for almost two years till I finally realized, oh. My my gosh it's because i i've never for 40 years i or whatever you know 37 years at that point i'd never been in a place this long that's why i like there my dna has been changed nature nurture however you want to look yeah, at it right it's... the nurture side is going dude you have to do something you have to move i couldn't stand the fact that I, and that's, that's when I started going through this phase where I was like, no, I need to repaint the kid's schoolroom, you know, cause it just needs to be a different <laughs> color. And we need to move this couch. And uh, I don't know, like we need to just get some new artwork in here. Like all these things I had to, I moved my office across the, the thing because it just, I needed a different thing. And I was like, you think about that. So interesting, that's what's yeah. happening to us every single day in some level is these, these things that we've just become accustomed to. So I was upper limiting and I felt like I had to change something. Um, those are the type of things that, that begin to happen in our lives if we allow them until we realize, wait a minute. No, I mean, I still haven't even, there are parts of our property I still haven't explored yet. Yeah. When I go explore those, then come back and decide if, if I really do, you know, hate this place. And that's when we started going down to the creek and we start. we discovered that we actually have uh, some, some sediment down there. There's a, you know, it's a long story, but there's like, there's this really cool stuff. Like we found all kinds of artifacts and, you know, like weird stuff and there's a we didn't even know there's another house part of like the chimney from another house in the hill on our property the house that was built oh, back in wow. 1910 that they tore down when they built this one they left like the chimney and what i think was maybe a dining room or living room and so there's this really cool brick thing back there like cool. these are things that all happened after that I'm still discovering stuff, you know? And so cool. if you think about that though, that's the kind of stuff like to tie that back to building a business, um, you know, we can even sabotage something when it's going really, really well, just from, because of, we're not used to it. Yeah. We don't, and sometimes it's, we don't think we deserve it. I don't think I deserve to be in the same house for, ten, I've been here for almost 13 years now or 12 yeah. years now. I don't think I deserve that. I don't think I deserve to live in comfort. I don't think I deserve to set some roots down and raise my kids in a home. And I mean, this is a crazy thing. Like our daughter might, she, we moved to her. She was six months old. She might, might, might never live in another house. Our son might literally graduate from high school <laughs> from this house. Like I don't deserve that. That's what our, that's what that mindset tells us sometimes. Yeah. I mean, when you were talking earlier about, you know, yelling at your son or whatever and a few other examples it's it's so interesting when you can understand to look at the different perspective mm -hmm. so that you don't buy into the negative which oftentimes is i think as humans we grab onto and continue to think about those negative things which then we're creating more stories and and really going the wrong way but being aware of you know hey that's just a bs thought and yep. then focusing on the positive, which you, you know, step through several of them and to realize, hey, that's simply just it's not true that I'm a bad dad. I had a bad moment mm -hmm. and I'm going to do, you know, make it right. And so real uh, quick, just to tie it back to your the original question, if if you really are just questioning, you know, your abilities, there's a couple of things I would I would encourage you. These are all from the book as well. But like if you go, you do that exercise, the exercise, and you're like, my passion is such and such. And I, I just do not, Matt, I, it's, I'm just not qualified, right? 
And I said earlier, first of all, don't compare your beginning to someone else's middle. We have all been there. I'm going to tell you right now, like I, you could tell me right now, Hey Matt, I need a whole sales funnel design. I could have it done for you by tonight, but there is a time and that would be my team would do actually they're off right now, but right. Notwithstanding the fact that they're off right now, because we're on, uh, we're on a break. Normally I could have it done same day. Boom. Charge two, three thousand dollars, easy peasy, right? Like that's yep. what we can do. There was a time in my life though, I I just like everybody, I was trying to get my website to do something I wanted, and I spent four and a half hours beating my head against the keyboard to try to make it happen. And I wanted to quit. I don't share that on Twitter. I don't share that on Instagram. I don't talk about that because that's doesn't help my brand right now. Yeah. But we've all been there. That's comparing my uh my beginning to someone else's middle. All right. The other one, again, comparing our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. The second thing is take advantage of your disadvantages. All right. Take advantages of your disadvantages. I'll talk about that in a second. But like, then think about, okay, you go through the exercise. I'm I'm scared of doing that. One of the quotes in the book, Stephen Pressfield says, fear is an indicator. Fear tells us what we have to do. All right. So the more scared you are, the more scared Alan was of getting on the phone with guys and saying, I can help you lose weight. The more scared that I was to be like, I can help you grow your online business. The more scared I was to write the book. I was terrified. So great. I gotta write this to 10, 10 steps. Like, how do you take somebody like the promise is that you're going to build a rewarding online business. I, who the heck am I? Right. Well, you've worked with all these people. Yeah. But still who the heck am I? Right. I've done it once for me and I've taught, maybe a couple thousand people. That doesn't qualify me to write a book, does it? Yeah, it does. You know, because I'm terrified of doing it. That's the, the assuredness that, so that we great. have. Stop running from fear and run to it. Yes. Okay? When the student is willing, the teacher will appear. We all know that one. And yeah. right now, there are thousands of people. Everyone of you listening, like just stop right now. There are thousands of people waiting for you to appear. Amen. They are willing. They are waiting for you to lead them. The only question is, are you willing to be their leader? And so I write about in the book, um, you know, some of the things about standing out, like making your liabilities an asset. I I said, like, turn those, those disadvantages into advantages. Think about, you know, Sylvester Stallone. We all know that we all, what's the iconic Sylvester Stallone line? Yo, Adrian. Yo, Adrian. <laughs> if he had not, you know, he was born, he has paralysis on the left side of his face from birth. I think they, re, I think if I remember correctly, they took some forceps, they had to pull him out. And when they did it, they paralyzed the left side of his face. If he had, like, he's from, you know, that area, he still would yeah. have kind of sounded like he's, but he wouldn't have had the, you know, that slight slur yeah. from the paralysis. If he had been like, yo, Adrian, that would not have been an iconic line. Terminator. Right. I'll be back. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Great. What a line. We have, who hasn't said that? No, it's, I'll be Bach. He even said it like Schwarzenegger said it. If I didn't have the crazy accent, I would still be in the, on the Alps yodeling, you know, like yeah. he, that's him. Uh, my friend, Darren Sargent, he's missing an arm. He, uh, he was born with ambiotic something or another. And basically it cut off the blood supply. He's only got like a third of his arm. He has a, his foundation is called the one uh, the thumb up foundation. He walks around going thumb up, you know, cause he only has one, you yeah. know, and, and he and I are like, like I can have fun with him cause I'm a friend. I can be like, hi, f-, I mean, like high five, you yeah. know, and like <laughs> switch hands and like all those things. And, you know, I told him like, man, it's so sad that we'll never do a beach volleyball high five. It's where you take both <laughs> hands and you make kind of like a semicircle, like wax on wax off with both hands. And I really miss that. That, you know, I need a friend. You know, I, I, you know, can you can you hook me up? Like, anyway. And so when he walks into a room, Darren is a middle aged white dude, coming from a pretty like nice background, not like super wealthy, but fairly good. When he walks into a, a room full, of, you know, five hundred high schoolers in a poor part of town, minority high school students, middle aged white dude walks in. Their first reaction, if he has a second arm, is this guy doesn't understand anything I'm going through. Amen. He has a physical acknowledgement within one second of seeing him. All right, I'll listen. Yeah. What you got? What do you got, one arm man? You know, like that's what they're saying because he turned that that disadvantage, all the things he can't do. He can't play trombone. Yeah. You know, all the things (laughs) he can't do. These are his things. (laughs) It's like I will never play guitar. You know, I'm like. (laughs) True. <laughs> I don't know. That you know, is so, whatever. Yeah. You know, 
all those things that he has a disadvantage, they're an advantage. Yeah, um, you know, you think about like, um, oh, what's the guy's name? Columbo, uh, Peter Falk. Peter Falk, it, for the older people, he had that squint, the Columbo squint. It's because his right eye was removed when he was three. He had a glass eye. It was not a, he wasn't doing it because he was a great actor. He was doing it because he didn't have a choice. Yeah. So we turn oh, those disadvantages into advantages. We can even, like the second way I talk about standing out in the book is experience. And I talk about like, you know, things like, yeah, I use my client list and I talk about how, you know, the degree, like the, the awards that I've won and all that affiliate manager of the year four times, but even lack of experience can be an advantage. When I ran yeah. for school board, I was, I was 22 years old when I ran for school board. And I said, I'm 22. I've been in a high school for three years, four years. I can relate to these kids. There you go. Yep. My slogan was a new age in education. And I remember one of the ladies, her name is Blanche Carter. Blanche was 60 some odd years old. She had a park named after her. This is who I'm running against. Like the time we, we had like 11 candidates. I'm not sure if it's still true, but at the time I was the youngest person ever in North Carolina to make it through a primary. And oh, wow. she got up and said, I have been in the education industry or business for, I've been in education here in Moore County for 45 years. And I, and I immediately responded with, I have been alive half that long. Yeah. That was my advantage. It's why go. I was able to accomplish what I accomplished. If I had been 34, then I, I would have just been like another middle-aged person running. I wouldn't have had the experience or the lack of experience. Right. So think about that. What is that thing that seems so like a disadvantage? Powerful. Yeah. Oh, I don't have the credentials. I'll share this story with you, Steve, as we wrap up. That is so powerful. This is the one that that, that sums that up. Just because I want people to get this through. Like, so there's a lady I was talking to a couple years ago. And, and this, there's only part of the stories in the book because I finished the manuscript and then I got the rest of the story, the Paul Harvey rest of the story, right? Yeah. So I get to share that with everybody here. And I was on the phone with this lady. She was signing up for our mastermind and she's like, Matt, I want to be in it. I, you know, I can afford it and I want to join. But there's only one question. And I was like, what is it? She said, I don't, I don't feel like I, I don't think I'm qualified to do this. See, she has two autistic children. And it's something I learned about people who have autistic children is uh, it's really hard. Having children in general is really hard. Yeah. There's well, so much, especially today, we got to worry about all these things. It's really hard, but it's really hard for them. And, and she said, I've got two autistic children, but Matt, I don't know if I can do a platform around that. Cause I don't have the letters after my name. I didn't go to Harvard. I didn't, I don't know the studies. I was just like, I dropped out of community college. Yeah. I said, and to this day, I still don't remember why I asked this question. I said, because it's, it's a really rude question. And it's just like, it was a divine question. I give God all the credit for even giving me the words to say, because if I hadn't asked this question, I don't know where this would have gone. I don't know that I would have been able to lead this conversation anywhere productive. Uh, but it's not one that I recommend asking. And I said, have you ever thought about killing your children? And she said, every day. Wow. I said, but you haven't. I said, as a matter of fact, you told me about your two kids, 13 and 10, that are pretty well adjusted. They have friends. They make good grades. They're productive members of society. They're not doing the things that we quote unquote expect autistic children to do. You even travel with them. She said, you're right. I said, it's one of the things about the traveling that I didn't realize is that parents with autistic children is often a nightmare to travel because you're taking a kid out of their routine, a kid who That's thrives right. on routine and you're waking them up early or putting them in bed late. You're putting on a metal tube that flies through the air at 38,000 feet. And you're trying to explain why they have to sit next to this stranger. And there's all these noises and nothing's happening the way that it's supposed to happen. And no, the flight said it was leaving at 1113, but it's 1142 and you're sitting on the ground still. How do you explain that to any child or any adult for that matter, let alone an autistic child? And it's a nightmare because the, that stress rubs off on the parents and then their stress, it, it becomes a vicious cycle and they're afraid everybody's going to look at them when their kid has an outburst. And so they're freaking out for days in advance. So they just don't travel with their kids. Wow. So fast forward a year later, I said to that lady, well, on that call, I said, but you haven't. So talk about that. That's Who cares about the letters behind your name? Who cares if you, what school you went to? Who cares if you know what an amygdala or an abdengala is or whatever the, you know, uh, the cerebellum does, or if you know what medication works for this, Share your story, share how the fact that you've raised 13, a 13 year old and a 10 year old who haven't killed each other and you haven't killed them. Just share that. So fast forward about a year I later, have. over 10,000 YouTube subscribers. 
Wow. From zero. Wow. And she sent me one of her videos. It was about traveling with autistic children. She did a video where she talked about how she's done it successfully for years. And there were over 250,000 views on this video. And there was one comment in particular, a lady said, You're, like, I, I don't know how to thank you. Uh, my son's seven. We haven't left the county we live in in four years because I've been terrified to go anywhere because of your video. I just booked a flight to Hawaii. Unbelievable. Wow. All she That's did powerful. was share what she knows. Yep. She's not an expert. She's an expert on her experience. We're all experts. Nobody can share so, your experience like you can. What, yeah. Whatever that is, you went to prison. Okay, great. You, you, you were addicted to something. Okay, that's, that's your experience. Nobody has your experience. You look for those ways where you do stand out. Maybe you, maybe, oh, there's somebody else saying the same thing. Yeah, but are they you? Are that's they, yeah. are, they're, they're married. They're married. You're single. Yeah. They're, they're single and you're married. They're married. You're divorced. You're old. They're young. They're young. You're old yeah. or whatever, you know, like they're white. You're black. Doesn't matter. Like we look for the male, female. We look for those things that stand out and we yeah. find, okay, I can say basically the same thing. I can even have the same message, but I yeah. can stand out in a way that's unique yeah. to me. That's unique to me. That is my unique thing. If you're, here's one little tip. If you're from the South, turn that twang up just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that Thank is you. one of your ways, like lean into those differences, even the ones that seem like they're a slight disadvantage. That is great. Wow. What? I mean, that is such a great way to end this. I mean, lean into those disadvantages and just, wow, that is fantastic. Well, Matt, man, I just appreciate your time, man. Where can people find you? Where are the best place to grab a copy of your book? Yeah. So if you go to, uh, you can buy the book anywhere, uh, Amazon, okay. Barnes and Noble, uh, Target, Walmart. If they sell books, they, they sell my book, but the best place to get it is passions into profits book.com forward slash after. Okay. So that that's for your, for your listeners there, Steve, oh, cool. passions okay. into profits book.com forward slash after when you go there, I've got, uh, we've got almost a thousand dollars in special bonuses. So oh, awesome. there's some stuff that we cover in chapter one about creating that. Like we just talked about earlier about your audience. I have a deep dive into creating your ideal customer avatar as a bonus. I've got an email marketing masterclass. Uh, gosh, there's so much other stuff there. So if you go to that URL, that special URL, passionsintoprofitsbook.com, I'm sure you'll put that into the, uh, the show you forward bet. slash uh, forward slash after that's the key yep. part. Okay. So passions in the profits book.com forward slash after that's where you'll get all the uh, special bonuses. So. Oh, yeah. I appreciate you doing that. Thanks so much. Pleasure, well, Matt, it's been a pleasure. Wish you and your family a happy new year and uh, look forward to staying in contact with you. Thanks, Steve. You got it. Thank you. Take care.